Um, it really is a pleasure to introduce our reader this afternoon, and I know it's only the second day of the 35th ODU Literary Festival. And I do want to mention that we would not be able to meet the many challenges of staging a five-day uh, festival like this, if not for all the wonderful volunteers and partners we have in the MFA program in the English department and in the college and university at large, and of course everyone who comes to these readings and looks for them every year. So thank you very much for coming, thank you for your support, it really means a lot to us. Um, and uh, Segueing into the introduction, I, 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 I was checking with Pat, you know, how many years has it been really that we've known each other and we were kind of able to agree on somewhere around 2000 or so. Mm -hmm. Not betraying my age too much, right? <laughs> so uh, we've known each other initially through mutual membership in a global Filipino writers electronic network and community called the FLIPS Listserv or LIST started by the poets Nick Carbo and Vince Gotera, and Vince, as you know, edits the North American Review. Outside of this, I've had the opportunity to be in a few writers' conferences with him, and of course followed and looked for his publications and noted news of his awards. His poems and essays have been published widely in journals and anthologies like Tin House, Drunken Boat, American Poetry Review, Harvard Review, the list goes on. And he is the author of three full-length poetry collections, and the most recent is The Beautiful uh, and Shattering Bone Shepherds. Also, My American Kundiman, and Up Rock, Headspin, Scramble, and Dive. His books have received many honors, the Association of Asian American Studies Award, the Global Filipino Literary Award, and the Asian American Writers' Workshop Members' Choice Award. He has also received the Allen Ginsberg Award and the James Hurst Poetry Prize, and you see a trend here, right? So anyway, I won't bore you with all of that stuff. So just to say, Pat is therefore a familiar name to readers and writers, not only in the Filipino and Filipino-American communities, but to anyone who closely monitors American poetry in these contemporary times, energized by multi-ethnic and diasporic voices. In 2009, he was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship to the Philippines, which basically, and I was very jealous seeing his Facebook pictures, basically allowed him to write his way through the islands and eat fish and rice with his hands almost every day for a year. But I think the most important thing about this wildly prolific and mesmerizing writer who declares proudly that he is the son of immigrants from the hard scrabble hills in the northern Ilocos region of the Philippines, is that his poems have such a visceral, yes, I am talking to you, effect. It would seem that you know him the moment you catch a hint of the gardenia in his last name, like a rose wearing an extra consonant, both beautiful and fierce, Rosal. It would seem that in this poet's words, you might hear the accents of long departed uncles, great grandfathers, grandmothers, not just their accents as much as the sun-baked smells of sleepy towns by the sea, of sweat, of the catch brought in by fishermen in their nets, the fish that fly in wide silver arcs to land at the feet of this poet walking in the alleys of Newark, New Jersey, where there are no other birds, there, there are other birds, but no shrikes. This poet is always saying, let me tell you a story. This poet is always saying, let me remember everything all at once, now, here, and of course, always in two or more time zones. This poet is always trying to memorize maps to places where a waterfall of languages will cut paths through sugarcane fields and concrete with the precision of a laser. In his poems, you will hear the sharp rattle of bone on bone, taste archipelagos on your tongue, smell the metallic tint of blood, hear the moan of a piano singing shamelessly of its love and despair. And because he is this kind of poet, in the midst of all of this music, Pat Rosal will make you hear your own. Please give him a hand.
Wow, that was so good. <clears throat> um, I'm so happy to be back. Um, it's great to see Sean and got Louisa and Tim and Yona Harvey was here and Robin Becker. We were all drinking together last night. And I stayed out <laughs> late, had two martinis. Woo! I'm ready for another one after this is done. Uh, so I have a plan. Um, the plan is to read um, a few poems. And then um, I've been doing, um, can folks hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've been doing audio projects too, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, when, I, when I get to that. So um, I'll begin with a couple of poems from Bone Shepherds. Uh, this first poem is called Delenda and Dunn, and it's for the motherfuckers with that sign up. <laughs> Delenda and Dunn, after Cornelius Eady. And so, we've all been told to shut up. Don't talk, they say, too fast, too loud, or for too long. Don't take too much time trying to tell the truth, but this is my work to break out among strangers into laughter. How I've watched small children, for example, fill with the lucky gust a poem can ride into the near stillness of a room and dance. For that, I am always, as now, grateful. My father tells me, in his seminary days during the Japanese occupation, most of the priests who ran that school were German. The boys then were to speak only in Latin and would surely be slapped three Sundays back if heard speaking the language of my father's country, which is a beautiful country and a beautiful language, and which has a curious word for being so suddenly seized by affection, you clench every muscle from your eyelids to your toes for wanting to hold a loved one tight, to squeeze one and kiss one so deep you place yourself and your beloved on the brink of physical harm. There's no word for this in English. No word for those small provinces of silence or for the kind of love that will trouble that silence into music. My work is trying to find the very word rippling in my body, which is a woman's body, my mother's, and a man's body my fathers, and nowhere to be found in the languages that have conquered the lands of my ancestors. On the outskirts of every empire, there are man-made lakes large enough to receive with ease 100 villages worth of bones tossed into them. This is a fact. There are more than 7 million Ilocanos in the Philippines, maybe a million in diaspora. All of us, at one time or another, have been told to shut up, don't talk too loud, too slow, or for too long. In Saudi Arabia, in Madrid, in Tokyo, in Milan, on Bowery, near the foot of First Street, we've been told this. Some of us have been famous liars, Ferdinand, for example, who married another liar, Imelda, and my grandfather, Capitan of the Barrio, who claimed to kick the shit barefisted and single-handedly out of 14 ruffians in the small barangay of Santo Tomas. Actually, he kicked the shit out of five. <laughs> Nine ran away. <laughs> These are not lies, this is the truth. I'm not wealthy, I can't buy space or time on billboards or websites. The name I inherit doesn't part columns in the city's daily journal. My family comes from a long line of farmers. My cousins scrub their chopping blocks with salt. They shush the goats before they kill them. Mm -hmm. right. Bienvenida Santo Tomas. Santo Tomas is the barangay or the barrio where my mom grew up. And uh, before the Fulbright, I went back to the Philippines. Well, I was, I was born and raised in New Jersey. Uh, I went to the Philippines for the first time when I was 13, and I didn't go back for like 20 something years, almost 25 years. So this is a poem about me going back for the first time since I was a, since I was a teenager. <clears throat> Bienvenida Santo Tomas. In the middle of my uncle's yard, a goat bound at the hooves 
wags its tongue. I've traveled 10,000 miles to be welcomed home by a town that knows me only by my middle name and photos sent by post more than 25 years ago. And there is an old man from the foothills of the barrio's far edge who has heard my Uncle Charlie drag this small beast to the block, heard the news by music, the bottles, the banging, the laughter inside the slaughter. The old man limps the half mile by foot up the long dirt road, unshod, a ratty tank top, a brand new Vegas cap, a cut black strip of inner tube draped around his neck, and in front of him, he's rolling the whole way, a common jug on its side, emptied of all its vinegar, dusty, immense, to his hip in height and three times the old man's girth. My uncle is strumming the guts out of his ukulele when the old man arrives, sets the huge jug upright, pulls the bike tube off his nape, and stretches it across the jar's massive ceramic yawn, holding the rubber strip in place with one big muddy toe. And on the downbeat of the first measure of the second chorus, he joins my uncle in the kind of mooing these beloved geezers swear has several times tricked a field of blossoms into bloom. The old man plucking from the makeshift bass, not so much a moan, but a pulse that ranges a full octave into each man's chest. The sinews of the old timer's arms straining, the long muscle of his back taut, his quadricep, his calves, his black foot pumping blood into his whole awful body, his maw flashing every one of his seven good teeth to heaven. <laughs> and if a man become the heart of a giant, the song of a giant, each one of us laughing like a giant, if each one of us fulfill the exact measure of a man, and if the goat at the same time is singing as it's dying among men who are singing and dying, the youngest cousin among us, butcher, slaughterer, elbow deep in the animal's belly, does not sing. The carcass, bloodlet now, also silent, as if its stillness were a source of music too, the way in death one becomes all the sounds one cannot make, the sum total of everything the living cannot say. Sometimes we have to sing just to figure out what we cannot say. <laughs> hey, I wanted to say this. Um, there was a poem in my first book. And I didn't. I didn't bring it with me, so I so I grabbed it up. They have a. The library has like the copies of all the writers uh, who are coming. The library copies of the book. So I pulled this off, and I'm a little bit pissed off because it looks like nobody took this shit out. Yet. <laughs> I think mean, if you don't buy one, at least check this motherfucker out. <laughs> And then, like, crack it open so it looks like somebody actually read it. <laughs> so, I went to Sherry's reading. Uh, she's not here. She, she, I went to uh, her reading earlier, and uh, she had this awesome passage about her, well, this, this, the narrator's labia. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's true. I'm not making this up. She wrote the motherfucking book. <laughs> and they are, uh, they are of sort of like different sizes and different textures. Uh, <laughs> they, are, they are asymmetrical. <clears throat> so I, this is, I, she's not here, but this is, I'm going to read this for, uh, for Sherry. <laughs> Who says the eye loves symmetry? Doesn't the eye love the ragged tear of sky, the treetop shred horizon? The eye, after all, loves the dizzy dip of a road, its precarious tilt towards a ravine, only wrist deep water and giant smooth rocks to break the sky's fall. The eye loves the bit peach, window agape, Buildings caught mid swagger across a skyline. The eye loves unpainted pickets, cracked planks, the harlequin, the prow poked out of water like a chin. The e loves the evergreen arched over a flood like an old man looking into the street for a hand. Loves a sawed link, chewed rope, a birch's slants. But the eye can't love what it can't see. The woman striding tired and brave amid the lobby's bustle, and under her shirt, a single breast. Thank you. Um, I was 
um, around there's something appropriate about having this conversation around a pool table with me half filled up with vodka and but I was speaking to Lucy and see around about um, wanting to go back to Argentina and writing about Argentina and our relationship um, to Spanish. Um, so I wanted to read this. Uh, this is for you, Lucy. <clears throat> I, um, I grew up in an all English speaking household. Um, but my parents spoke Ilocano at home. And of course, we had, they had family friends who spoke Tagalog. My dad is an ex-Catholic priest, so he spoke Latin too. Actually, when he would whoop us, <laughs> he would quote St. Thomas Aquinas in Latin and be like, ah! <laughs> Implora Mazzuno! <laughs> St. Thomas Aquinas didn't say that, but it's Latin. It's only Latin. Uh, <laughs> so, and he spoke, he speaks Spanish too, you know? Um, and later in my life, I learned some Ilocano, some Tagalog, but the, my second language really is Spanish. Um, the thing is that my, my father and I never spoke Spanish to one another. Uh, I went to Argentina for a month because I was trying to forget this girl who broke my heart. Um, it doesn't work. <laughs> but it was good for my writing. And um, about three days in, I figured that I should call my dad and let him know that I was okay down in Argentina. And be my dad my whole life. We have not gotten along well. To this day, it's a troubled relationship. I love him dearly. Um, but the thing about that conversation was that, we, that I called him up and almost as a joke just sort of started speaking to him in Spanish. And then we had this whole conversation in Spanish. And it was brilliant because, uh, number one, it was a language that we hadn't spoken to one another in. But the consequence of that is that uh, we had never, we'd also never screamed at each other in that language, right? It was a language that didn't know anger between me and my father. And so we had this amazing conversation for the first time, and it took this other language to sort of um, bring me and my father together um, like that. So, as glass. When the sounds of Buenos Aires holler in chorus from the muck-blessed soccer field across the street, they're calling to me in the formal idioms their fathers use to ignore the ubiquitous feral dogs and the beggars of Recoleta. I understand just enough to fling back halfway to the park's paved border their summer toughened leather ball and return to my hard floor Palermo flat to phone my dad back in Jersey. Papa, I say, tu hijo habla. Of course, at first, he doesn't recognize my voice or even his own name, for I am speaking to him with an affection whose prepositions point in all the wrong directions. But for six full minutes, we are unfamiliar with one another's rage. For once, we are laughing at the same time. It's simple. We don't loathe one another in Spanish like we do in English. A language I've long known for its fluid burn, the way it rises from my father's ankles into his belly, from his torso into his limbs, like molten glass. This is why he and I can glare at one another for decades without moving, all the lexicons of sadness and delight turning cold and hard about every muscle and bone, twisting around the capillaries, flooding the metacarpal nooks, stopping in the esophagus, so with flesh, sinew, and gut, this human crucible were to fall away as it must, what's left is the clear anatomy of a man cast in language, unsummoned for 77 years, the whittled wooden fans of his childhood, his mother's calessa rocking over vegan cobblestone, a whore's warm breast flushed against him like a good bottle of rum, cracked cathedral windows, some cots and soup, and all 400 years of horse shit poured hot through his veins, and I, I am there too, sitting in a chilly apartment in Palermo, listening to the fading howls from the football field, the bold charity of a foreign tongue sweetening the image in my mind of this quickly aging man who whacked me and my brother silly with his leather belt. And down the street, 
I can still hear those boys teasing one another in Lunfardo. Maybe they're not too young to despise their fathers. Maybe they can already taste in the prayers they pretend to say before they sleep that petty venom distilling in their mouths. But not today, not in this Castilian. For today, this speech of imperial thieves, this dialect of conquerors, this larcenous parlance, I am taking back as my own. And every word of every tenderness I have failed to speak is already rising through my knees as glass. It is ancient and it is pure. It is not free of bitterness or grief. It is heating my very fingers as I write this. I want to learn to love more fluently. Even if it means in English, I should shatter into the body of my father. So um, I'm going to read one more poem, <clears throat> and then um, some audio stuff, and then if there's time, I don't know that there will be, but if there's time, I will, uh, oh, we got a lot of time. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I'm gonna, let's see how this goes. I, I, I'm going to read this poem, which is sort of a uh, kind of a love poem for the state that I grew up in, New Jersey. And then. I have a longer audio piece, um, which is also sort of like a love song, spoken word piece for New Jersey. Um, so, and then I'll do another, I'll perform a short sort of hip hop piece, and then maybe if I got time, I'll do, a, I'll do one or two more poems after that. So this is Kundiman ending on a theme from Tila Rock. <clears throat> Your morning's everyday stained call of exhaust. Your plum blood and dust. Your fine stench, your luckless French kiss, your can I get down bliss, your God gone, blessed Jones for loan, your Jersey Baroque, your mercy nine sirens prying every sky, your name, your flow, your funk, your everyday nasty, your very revelry, your breakneck scat, the loot, your boots, your rags, your 7,000 island slang, your hype, your hits, your spit, your sickest wit and snip, your every severed syllable, your blunt tote fables, your smokes reprieve, your levers torque bearing, your body every day, every lovely mucking hum, your mic sound nice, every check, one, your fade, your cut, your knife, your jazz on two, your bass, your every cleft, your left breast, your folly, your lung, your modest rock, your alibata tongue, do you want it? Hell yeah, baby, because it's yours. <laughs> so, so this is like an opportunity for me to take like a 10 minute break. <laughs> Um, and I hope this works. We, we didn't have like a real sound check, so um, if, it, if it, the sound is not great or it's going a little too long, I may just stop it short. Um, I should say a little bit about this. The internet is pretty amazing. Um, and just sort of screwing around online, I found an old Army uh, Corps of Engineers document that was, um, that talked about this huge tract of land that was across the street from where I grew up. And um, what it was used for for almost the entire 20th century was, uh, well, for various things, but it was all military, barracks, and mostly to store ammunition from everything from like, you know, like shells to like shells to shells. <laughs> um, and so I found this document that um, after like all the, I was sort of a plan on how to remove everything that was left over, everything that was buried underground and, and so forth. And so this spoken word piece begins with me reading a chunk of this document. Um, and then I go into sort of like, um, it's kind of another love song for New Jersey. You know, Chad Hugo, and everybody know who Chad Hugo and Pharrell is? He's, they're from around here. What? How about, hands up if you know who Chad Hugo, nerd, nerd, and everybody know, no one ever really dies? Come on, oh my god, are they that out of vogue? Is like everybody listening to like Lady Gaga now? They know <laughs> anyway, I think they're brilliant. They're from Virginia Beach. Um, uh, Chad Hugo's Filipino. I think Pharrell might have a little Filipino in him too. Um, and I think they're brilliant musicians and arrangers. And I love their music. And I've been listening to a lot of it. And um, I've been trying to figure out ways in which hip hop and pop music fused with um, 
what I do as a poet and as a writer, what are, what are the possibilities? And so, um, I know motherfuckers hate autotune, but <laughs> you're gonna get some today. <laughs> so this is, about, this is about 10 minutes long or so. If it goes a little long, I'll stop it short. Oh. Approximately 20 miles southwest of Manhattan, New York. Rarian Arsenal was established in 1917. Did you hear that, Beth? Storage depot for shipments overseas. Because of its strategic location, it was established as a permanent ordnance depot shortly after World War I. Depot operations at that time consisted mainly of vehicle storage and ammunition receiving, storage, shipping, transfer, and repacking. Types of ordnance handled included 37mm and 40mm projectiles, fuses, pyrotechnics, grenades, training rounds, and TNT. I grew up in a little shit town, waiting for its Ford plant to shut down. As if the county needed another big box or 99 cent store. I'll show you my town, my town. I'll show you my town, my town. The strip mall in South Main used to be a field. Gold grass, chest high, where me and the other neighborhood boys, bunny hop huffies and mongooses over puddles and bit hillocks, flipping our bikes over our bodies. I remember every once in a while a band of men would go from house to house asking if folks didn't need the straight two by fours mostly split, most with crooked nails just lying around. They'd offer to take the whole stack of wood damn near rotting at the corner of your yard. In Edison, New Jersey. In Edison, New Jersey. Pyrotechnics. Because of its grenades. Because of its pyrotechnics. Because of its grenades. Those old Peruvians and Mexicans that managers thought only good for bagging bargain tampons and action figures pissed off the likes of fat, pale Steve Wickside, who lived across Westervelt, who was likely to come bobbing, pink-faced with both fists at his side, yelling at me to turn that shit down, but also likely to carry a fresh six-pound bluefish every other weekend in spring from his outboard engine boat to my mother's arms at seven in the morning. lady at the fold-up table calls me honey, checks my identification points, hands me my official documents, and tells me to come back with better proof of who I am. To be honest, I'm a little sad the lines of Kilmer move so quick these days. I bought this 500-page biography of Gabriel Garcia Marquez to sit and read among the members of my Jersey tribe, whose passports are not all blue. These loyal sons and daughters who scan barcodes at Target and push mops down the dark wings from Med Surge to Morgue, whose homeland borders have been redrawn and renamed. The whole world is right here, in this state that America mocks. Passers through hold their noses from 16W to Carteret on the way to DC or Disney World. Meanwhile, the old poles at the Linden cogeneration plant still suit up in bunker gear for drills, steadying each other to walk down the 40-foot wall of chemical flame. Edison, New Jersey. Pyrotechnics. Because of its grenades. Edison, 37 million. Because of its pyrotechnics. Because of its grenades. That's what I've been working on. Um, um, is sort of a, I want to make beats, <laughs> and so it's been a lot of fun. You know, I I, um, I produced dance music in the '80s, and um, you know, I'm an old school b-boy, and I I think part of me wanted to resurrect a little bit of um, of what hip hop does. If you all are sort of interested in the tradition, 
Um, there's a record that's been lost at this point, um, but it's Paul Hardcastle's 19, and um, like basically I bit what he did. Um, it's this hip hop record, he's in a, a, a Roman 808 drum machine, and um, he basically takes all these news clips and, um, and some spoken word stuff, and he talks about how the average age of a soldier in the Vietnam War was 19, 19, and another 19. And you know, we were dancing to this, <laughs> you know? And there was something about, about witness and dance that fused together that I, that I wanted to try to do. I'm gonna do uh, one more piece and then I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read a poem. But it's gonna take me a, just a second to load this up. How's everybody doing? The other thing I want to say is that I haven't done this in public before. <laughs> so I'm learning how to do this shit. Thank you guys for... <laughs> um, this other piece is, um, this is sort of more the direction that I've been going lately. And it's a, it's, a, it's a hybrid of spoken word, music production, journalism, sound art, so forth. Um, Audrey and Rich died early, was it earlier this year? Yes. yes. And so I was on a panel with Alicia Allstriker about um, Audrey and Rich's um, collage strategies in, in her poem. And I had to write this lecture, and I didn't want to write a lecture. <laughs> so um, I made a collage. And what I basically did was, um, it was out of the low residency at Drew, and I went around and I asked people um, four questions. Uh, and I can't remember what they are. <laughs> You'll hear what they are. The, the only limit to your answer was that it had to be no longer than four words long. So you're going to hear uh, you're going to hear Adrienne Rich's voice, uh, and, and um, she'll hear Stevie Wonder. Um, Roy Air sample is in here, um, and then like Gerald Stern, Alicia Ostriker, Ellen Watson, Adeseli's Gear, Meyer, Ross Gay, a bunch of students from Drew. You're going to hear um, you're going to hear all their voices in here. <clears throat> And it, it was a response to her book, at, um, Atlas of the Difficult World. First, having read the book of myths, equality is not for all. My dad was standing in the trash and doing that for them, for them, for them. What have you lost? What have you lost? Ah, What's the wreckage? Ah, what will you keep? Ah, what will you keep? Ah, what is the difficult world?
So, um, yeah, so I'm working on this. Um, um, there's a bunch of different projects that I think this has many, many applications. Um, I'm going to go into my own neighborhood in Bedside, Brooklyn, um, and talk to people about, about work. Um, um, I want to, you know, a lot of my family worked in hospitals and they weren't nurses and doctors. They, they worked in kitchens, in kitchens. My brother was a janitor in a hospital. Um, and so there are all these Filipinos who work in hospitals who are not sort of like paraprofessionals. They're just like working folks, you know? And um, to, to sort of like redefine what work is and what kind of work we value, um, that's another one. And then I'm working on this other project were, um, there were 58 people slaughtered in the Philippines the month after I left. 36 of them were journalists. And um, I'm putting together a, uh, an audio project now in which all of the, um, all, it's a music bed like this and then there's like interviews that are coming in and out. The music bed is made all um, from samples of my printer printing out the names of the dead. Mm -hmm. um, and all th that sound is, um, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing this thing called granular synthesis in which you take individual waves of sounds and can turn them into like synthesizers and, mm. and all kinds of things. So the thing that's, nothing, almost nothing in the actual music sounds like a printer. It sounds like something that you could dance to, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's, that's sort of where I'm at. I, I know this is supposed to be like a literary fest and whatever, but I don't know the, I don't know the beginning and the end of a poem. Like I don't know, I don't know, to me this is poetry, like there's not like, there's no sort of separation. The word discipline, like we're in a university and like the di word discipline comes from the Latin to cut apart. And it was designed so that you had English here, history here, philosophy here, science here, technology here. My learning and my life was not separated into those categories. Um, I was a dancer and I was a musician and I was an altar boy and I was a son and I was a failure and I'm a musician. And, everything, and I want to pour all that stuff in here, um, and that's enough preaching for me. <laughs> um, one more poem? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, we'll do one for now. All right, I'll do two. <laughs> We were talking about, we were t last night at the bar, there was such a great night last night. We were talking about who could beat the shit out of who. <laughs> Let me see if I can find this phone, because it would be perfect follow-up to, <laughs> to our conversation last night. Ross Gay is a, he's a part, does anybody know his poems at all? He's like brilliant. Um, and one of my best friends in the planet. And um, we love, anybody, any MMA fans in here? Come on, yeah. yeah. Love seeing two dudes just beat the shit out of each other, <laughs> wearing nothing but lycra shorts. It's the best. Uh, <laughs> and uh, before there was the UFC, so how many of you remember Pride Fight? Remember that league? Yep. So there was no, and even in UFC early days, there was no weight classes. So you could have like really big dudes like me and Tim could like go at it. Like, Tim would beat the shit out of me. So I really do it. <laughs> um, you could have like these, you could sort of like almost. Circus matchups, you know what I mean? So this poem, me and Ross were teaching at this residency of Sarah Lawrence College, and he brought these DVDs of like of, of Pride Vice, and we spent the whole night like watching it. <laughs> One of them was this really big dude and this really skinny dude fighting each other, and I said, I, I gotta write a poem about it. <laughs> Pride Fight. The 600 pound man and the 150-pound man <laughs> square off. <laughs> and people have paid to see these two nudge each other blow by bloody, bloody blow or by submission as close as possible to death's front porch. We're yelling, fuck him up, oh shit, get out the way, smash him! <laughs> well, I don't know who I'm rooting for. <laughs> I'm an American. I could want the pale runt to wreck the dark hulk to his knees, or cheer the giant as the pipsqueak darts around a ring to dodge his lumbering foe. The big man is casual, swipes a paw at the air and misses when the little man scuttles by. And this goes on for some time, the crowd jeering, no one in particular. We know, deep in our bodies, 
just about anything is grotesque if you make it large enough. Science says in nature all forms fail when you multiply them by scale. And in this near death match, I wonder if what we're yelling at isn't a behemoth's bull rush toward the sack of taut scrawn, the farthest margins of all the gruesome multitudes each of us contains. On one end, all that is puny, a fragile and fleeting thrash of flesh. On the other, everything humongous and terrible, as if we could measure every catastrophe according to this exponential order. Dear Old Dominion, <laughs> perhaps if you're like me, you're asking, yeah, 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 Pat, but who wins? And I'll tell you, it is the big man who catches the little man charging in. The big man falls full weight and smothers his rival whose face is smushed against a massive cat. So the little man flaps and squirms, turns red, he manages from the bottom with both his legs to take hold of the big man's leg. The smaller man, struggling, tucks the one enormous foot in his armpit and with the might of every buck and a half of muscle in his body, arches his back and vice-like squeezes. If we thought the big man had but one stoic face for the world, he shows us at least one other, and it is pain. The big man, sweaty and exhausted, his ankle about to snap, taps out. No one in or out of the ring exults. We are the ones who can't move. We fall into a moment of precise silence, as if we can't believe our eyes, as if We've just witnessed two men become exactly the size of ourselves. Mm. One quick poem, I'll try to do it from memory, and then if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer. Poem is about what it takes to write a poem, or make a poem. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> takes stones in the hole dug deep Takes a knot in the back and shoulders slump Takes a whole lot of fallen trees Dead wood drop brush Takes genuflection at black rock Takes a psalm in the valley blown Takes one good breeze Takes a guy with broad hands and a breast Soft enough for me to lay my head to lay My head takes prayer Thank you for dirt Thank you for stubborn oak roots Thank you for the triple I knew I was going to forget it Thank you for dirt Thank you for Oh shit. <laughs> Something wings without a name. <laughs> For sweat to cool me down. Takes earth and lake. Takes the night. Takes the stiff light by moons. Takes a fire to warm my feet and a dragon I can't see. Takes a whole lot of faith. Sturdy, sturdy faith. Hey, I got it. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>